Hello, guys. Hi. Mike, Hi. Alina, how are you? Yeah, good. good. How's how, how's your day going? Very good. Pretty well. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a good good Monday so far. Yeah. We're COVID free in the office mm. this week, which is good. I like what you guys do actually with the office. I really love the fact that before I came here, you, you, I was asked by Emma saying, "Have you had a test? You, you just needed to do a lateral test, measure your temperature." Not many places do that. But then again, kind of expected from you guys. <laughs> yeah. isn't it? It's a bit of an expect. There is that. We have to set a bit of an example, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. So, look, w- the whole point of today. Thank you guys for joining us. It isn't really about talking about Acurex. We're not here to talk about Acurex. We know what Acurex is. So we've already um, got a recording about that. We're here to talk about this legendary vaccine (laughs) product, which you've rolled out in four weeks. I mean, if you were to ask anybody uh, to roll out a product in four weeks, they would kind of just put their hands on their head and say, okay, what kind of a product are we talking about? So that's what we're here to talk about. But let's start with a small introduction. Elena, ladies first. Do you want to tell us a little bit about you? What is it that you do here at Acurex? And then we'll move on to Mike. Uh, So I'm Elena. I'm one of the product engineers here at Acurex. I've been here for about a year. Um, A lot of that time has actually been spent doing AccuBook, which is very exciting. Uh, So I mainly am a front-end engineer. Actually, I was full stack for part of the time on AccuBook, but mainly I do a lot of front-end engineering. Um, and so that involves a lot of the kind of UI, it involves a lot of the accessibility, which is a lot of the work that I do. Uh, and uh, a lot of the remit of product engineers at Acurex is getting stuck into a lot of different things anyway. So it's also quite a wide remit of getting involved with like user research and monitoring and these sorts of things, but also mainly, you know, actually writing the code and getting the product built. Thank you very much. What about you, Mike? Uh, so hi, yeah, I'm Mike, uh, another product engineer. Uh, I was a uh, tech lead for Acubook. Um, I've been here for two and a half years now. <laughs> feels like feels like longer. About two and a half years. Um, one and a half in COVID. Yeah, one and a half at discounting for the COVID year. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, I've been working on a, a number of different sort of areas of the, of the, of the products we had for a while. So obviously, Agrix when it was smaller was uh, just in GP uh, clinics. Had the desktop toolbar. Was working on that, um, and then we've moved on to sort of do batch messaging, um, patient triage, um, which I think we'll probably end up talking about later anyway. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so focusing on Acubook for the last six months or so. Sweet. So Acubook, just to highlight, Acubook, for those who don't know, which I don't think many people know, it is the um, vaccination uh, booking system or software that you guys have put together. Yeah, I think a lot of people in the country would have encountered AccuBook, but would actually know it by name. So pretty much anyone who's received an SMS from their GP to book their vaccine has actually interacted with the, with the product. And for us, that's like tens of millions of people. So I think actually a lot of people will have used it without actually realizing knowing that, that this is, but yeah. this is AccuBook, basically. <laughs> right, see, that's that's. Let's talk about that. That's the whole point of it of this. So um, COVID hit, sent the whole world into chaos. Um, then. The vaccines come out. So what I really would like to know, and I'm sure lots of people would want to know here, one of the main factors that leads to a successful project, a tech project, is planning. So let's start with that first. How much planning actually went into this? Uh, yeah, I mean, we definitely still had a planning aspect. Of, of what we were doing. We didn't just jump in on the first day. There were definitely a lot of kind of meetings around what it would be and, you know, the go, no go and kind of us deciding how long it might actually take to build a product. Um, four weeks, like you're saying, is very, very fast to launch a product. Um, and, and I think almost a lot of our uh, cycles and things involve a little bit more user research than we actually did with AccuBook, where we really tried to combine all those things together such that we could get it out of the door. Um, it was it was it was mid November when we um, started the sort of planning for us doing AccuBook, and it was like mid December when we released it. So this was very fast for us, and I think uh, it like it seemed very fast at the time as well. It was a, it was a pretty chaotic yeah. <laughs> chaotic time in some ways. I think I mean the, obviously there was some planning that went on before we decided to like pull the trigger and start on it, but that didn't involve the development team as a whole. Um, I think the go no go was I think thirteenth of mm. November, and I think before that we'd had some sort of high level discussions, but 
the first week after that was just solid planning. So we had people basically locked in a room, coming up with designs, <laughs> iterating, talking to users, um, while we were sort of really focusing on what ifs and, and high level sort of ideas of what we could do for the data model, for the APIs, that kind of thing. Um, really just kind of trying to just sort of storyboard it, uh, whiteboard it, work out all of the basic pieces uh, and also play, playing off our strengths there um, in terms of what we already had. You don't want to build something that's novel in four weeks. You want to use what you've already got. So I think that was a big part of it. As a tech lead, Mike, if we put this aside and we just take a step back, if I'm to ask you, what are some of the biggest challenges you could face in delivering a project in four weeks? What would you say there? Uh, yeah, so I, understanding the problem is probably the, the foremost uh, challenge. You, you don't want to just go off half-baked and, and not really know what you're doing. Um, uh, making sure that you've got the right people to uh, build the solution, I think, is also really important. Um, you've got to make sure you've got the skill set. Um, and given the really short time scale, I, I think you need people that work well together to be able to do that, uh, which luckily we had. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's probably start there. Elena, on to that then. Which one of these would be applicable to AccuBook? Or did you guys experience completely different challenges altogether? No, I think all the things Mike's saying is really fair. Definitely the problem space was quite new. We didn't know what the like uh, the COVID vaccine program would look like because things hadn't really been done at that scale before. It was quite new. We we had a bit to build off on terms of, you know, we know how flu vaccines and things are usually delivered, but we didn't know what it would actually look like. Uh, and it made it very hard to kind of understand the problem space because almost, you know, we didn't know and people who were delivering the vaccines didn't know. Uh, and a lot of these things almost changed underneath us as the program progressed and things changed and guidelines changed around things. So it, uh, we tried to be very, very uh, research focused and really kind of understand the problem and talk to people and figure things out. And so that really helped us when we were talking to a lot of users every single week, going through dozens of people and talking to them, understanding how things are changing, understanding what they need and what we need to be building. Because for us, it's also then about prioritization. We're only so many engineers, we're only so many, so big of a team, we're only so many researchers and designers, etc. Uh, so we really needed to very heavily prioritize, I think, what we were building because we want to solve every problem, but we're only going to be able to solve so many problems with our product. And we really wanted to try and build that flexibility in, but then also make sure that we were building the right features. Absolutely. Um, how ready would you say you guys were when you found out this now? This is now a project that you have to deliver? I mean, I don't think you're ever completely 100% ready to just pivot like that. Um, it's, it's obviously a big switch, but I think we were, we were in a pretty good place. Um, we, had a, we had an idea of how we can uh, put together what we have already built. So, uh, for example, um, before, uh, so our, our team obviously moved on to doing um, AccuBook. Before that, we were building uh, batch messaging, for example. And what we decided was that actually batch messaging and the technologies we built for that was actually quite appropriate for the initial um, sending out of invites to patients. So we could take that along with our expertise in other areas. Um, uh, I mean, obviously SMS messaging in general was something we have a lot of experience with. And there was gonna be a lot of SMS messages flying around as part of this system. Um, so we had like, you know, confidence that we could just build on top of that. Um, and we had, a, I guess, this wider support in the company to be able to just really knuckle down and focus on this particular problem um, rather than being distracted by other things. If I'm to ask, maybe the top two challenges that spring to your heads that you felt you had coming up doing this. I know I keep talking about challenges, but again, this is four weeks. This is not something simple. This is four weeks to create such a massive, massive piece of work. The challenges are interesting as well, right? You're not really <laughs> talking about. Exactly. <laughs> they are interesting. How did you know? What were the top two, would you say? Uh, I think us trying to deliver something in four weeks also meant that we didn't have so many cycles of iteration as we might do on another product where you really want to release the MVP, figure out what people like. And that's kind of our approach usually with other products to really kind of hone down on what we should be doing. 
and it works very well, but within four weeks, you don't have so much of the chance to do that. And we still, we still tried to, we still put uh, prototypes and when, where we didn't have kind of the full prototypes, we were putting screenshots of bits and, you know, letting people click through different, different kind of interfaces and seeing what landed. So we were still trying to do that, but it was a very condensed time scale. So it meant that we didn't have as many cycles to hone stuff down before we really started putting it out for quite a lot of people. You know, it went out for a lot of people overnight um, when we were starting out. And so we almost didn't find out about every problem in advance, which is what you kind of want to do. Um, and, you know, we found out as we were going along what features uh, people wanted the most, just only when we started rolling out at scale. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I think I think the biggest challenge for me was the fact that users didn't have all the information themselves to know what they wanted. Um, and the national program was still very much in its infancy and was changing underneath us as we went. And so a lot of the time, the product team had to work. Um, a gut instinct would be for, you know exaggerating it, but um, we had to go with what we, we knew was going to be a solid choice and give us a few options based on how things were going to play out. Um, so some of the decisions we made on the back end uh, to support um, things at scale were based on the fact that, well, this could go this way or it could go this way, but if we build it this way, we can support both options. Um, and I think that was kind of the direction we were going now. If I were to ask, compared to how you guys usually work, how different was it working on this? Did you have to change anything or was it to you guys business as usual yes there are challenges but we know what we're doing or was it you know um certain ways of working had to be changed certain methods need to be different etc etc yeah i think we tried to keep a lot of what we usually do in terms of research and you know making sure that we're uh, communicating well and still getting involved with all different parts of the team but there were definitely bits that changed a little bit just because of the time scale us, you know, uh, me as an engineer, I would usually go to a lot more research sessions than I than I might have done at that time. Um, there were definitely a lot of kind of uh, bits we were doing with the code where we would focus a little bit more on manual testing and making sure that things worked like that before we went out as opposed to trying to be very, very rigorous with catching every single edge case and our regression testing. Um, we, we worked a little bit more siloed, I think, than we usually would in terms of really pushing to say, this is your part of the product. You can be heads down on it for the week and you don't, you spend a bit less time pairing or knowledge sharing, or as usually these are things that we'd want to do a bit more. But because of us saying we've got four weeks, we shunted a bit of that forward, I think, to say, you know, we'll have a bit of time later to knowledge share about the code and get everyone used to working on everything. By the time we almost purposely siloed ourselves off a little bit to say, you're building this flow, you're building this flow and really sort of get heads down into it. Was it, did you have uh, the whole of Accurate basically working on AccuBook or was there, were there any other, other projects happening at the same time and this would have to be a dedicated team put together for this? So the short, short answer is, is no, uh, it wasn't the whole of, of Accurate. We, we had existing stuff going on that we needed to continue to support. Obviously our users, uh, our existing user base very much, um, uh, GP practices for the most part at the time. Um, they obviously had increased workload and they really needed to be able to work efficiently um, and we needed to keep continuing to support them, video conferencing, test, text messaging, so on. Um, so no, we couldn't afford to have the whole company just pivot onto this. Um, equally, when you're building on those kind of timescales, um, the additional context sharing as you scale the team out can add a lot of overhead. So we had to make a call to say, let's keep it relatively a relatively small team to work on this. And how big was the team? Roughly. Let's, let's get uh, this right. <laughs> uh, well, it, it varied a little bit as we as we pulled people in occasionally, but I think we were, what, 9, 10? Maybe yeah. a bit smaller. The, 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 the product team, so uh, this particular product team, so PM, um, engineers, researcher, designer. Um, but on top of that, of course, we still had um, the wider company giving us a lot of support. So obviously CTO, VP of Eng, were working hard to, to support us as well. Um, and um, on top of that also, just everything on the support side um, and the ops side in terms of uh, actually getting all of the approvals with the NHS, rolling out practices, getting contracts, all that kind of thing sorted so that we had 
the runway to be able to do this. So it was very much a wider, it was very much a wider org thing, um, but the engineering team specifically obviously weren't all focused on this. This to me sounds like a, an all-star team basically, <laughs> putting together, bringing together the dream team to, to deliver this. But also from the sound of it, this is something that the entire Accurex actually came together to do because yes, obviously you have a dedicated team to that, but the rest of Accurex had to pull on, as you said, extra weight in order to give you guys the luxury of focusing purely on that and not having to worry about something else, for example. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, um, I mean, we, it's not like we were, we were sitting on our hands before this as well. We, had, we were working on another product area and uh, we had to hand that over to, to another team to pick up. Um, so we were working on, as I said, I think I mentioned earlier, there was some batch messaging stuff we were doing. We were also starting to look at um, appointment reminders. Um, and we couldn't just drop, drop that work on the floor because we had users that already started to use it. We were relying on it. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of a lot of things for other other teams to pick up as well to support that. I saw something. I, when I say something, I saw something. I read in an article on Medium, basically mm -hmm. your the Acrex page page on on Medium, that you guys started using trunk based development. Correct, or not? To me, that shows you have very high level of faith in the people that you have because. Um, now, I'm not going to get too technical here, but yes, it has a lot of pros, but some of the con the downside to that is normally if people aren't necessarily up to the level, it can be a bit chaotic. So you've kind of, you know, is it safe to say there was a gamble to, to, to use that or was there that much faith in the team that you guys knew everybody was that good that we could basically pull it off? I think there's obviously, I think, a lot of faith in the team. I think we've got a great team. Um, and I think like, it's been very successful uh, working that way. Um, we do have a lot of trust in the team, and I'm really glad that we, we have that. Um, equally, it's not, it's not a free-for-all. <laughs> you know, we, have, we have processes in place. We, we do code reviews. So there's continuous integration. Um, uh, so you know, that, it's, not, it's not quite as scary as you make it sound. <laughs> But credit where credit is due, you know, it, it, it shows that you guys had that level of skill in the team as it is. So it's a, it was a, that good of a team. But to move on swiftly to another thing, which I would say many people would agree is very challenging. The first, let's just say, uh, group of people to use it were the over 80s, mm. age-wise. How do you manage to deliver that, ensure it's right for that group of people who potentially aren't necessarily very tech savvy and, again, ensure a smooth delivery? Um, yeah, it's definitely a very challenging user base, I think, compared to maybe a lot of other tech companies, especially tech startups who typically have much younger user bases with much sort of shinier tech. Uh, and those things are a bit more predictable. And it's, so, it, it's quite a different group of users. They're not... Uh, a, what's the word? Um, yeah, it's quite a different group of users. They're not all very tech savvy um, and they often don't have a need to be anyway, um, just for their day to day. So they're almost not used to encountering a lot of tech if they don't use it for their work or anything. And they're not um, used to the kind of design patterns that you might try to use with a lot of software thinking or users will understand that if I put a hamburger menu here, they'll know that this is a menu or these kinds of things. Um, and so you have to almost think about it a bit more sort of making things very, very obvious as to what users should be doing and really thinking about cutting back a lot of the things that you might put on to make things look very shiny, but actually reduce a lot of usability for people who really just want to come onto a website, get this one task done and then go again. Um, and we were very conscious that everyone doesn't have a smartphone or a computer and really of building that secondary flow into our product from the start to still, you know, the main aim for us with doing SMS booking and things was to free up uh, admin staff uh, at GP practices to really go and have the time to make phone calls and, and send letters and things to people who are harder to reach. So for us, we 
you know, the over 80s. And we actually saw a very good uh, uptake with over 80s, where I think we had about 60, 70% of them would book in from the SMS, which uh, is quite wow, high. That's... Yeah, and I think it's it's like a lot of, a part of the reason we use SMS as opposed to smartphones and apps and things, because a lot of people are, uh, like most people will still have some kind of SMS capability. And so, you know, you can open that on your phone. If you haven't got a smartphone, you can open it on the computer. You can send it to to your children or grandchildren and kind of get a little bit of help with that. Uh, and I think we're very lucky that, you know, our designs have always typically landed quite well with people. We had a couple of other uh, patient-facing things before, so we had a bit of an idea about how to design for these things. But when you're uh, making things for people in healthcare, you're almost... Your target market just is a little bit uh, older, maybe has a bit more accessibility needs. And so we were quite lucky that we were already used to that anyway. Um, and we, you know, to have kind of 60, 70 percent uptake is quite high. Like we, we were very pleased to see that a lot of people just were booking in like that without needing a huge amount of help or anything with it. Uh, and for us, the focus is just on making everything really, really simple such that, you know, anybody of any age can use it. And I think these things um, translate well, right? It's not just about, you know, this interface only works for over 80s. It's that it's simpler for everyone. You you mentioned, you guys mentioned previously when we had the chat, you kept going uh, or focusing on two areas which you were telling me were instrumental to the success of this project, this, this the Acubook. And they were user feedback and support. Mike, do you want to tell me a little bit, starting maybe with the user feedback, because again, this is, I keep going on about that, but it is four weeks, like how much feedback could have been, that could be done within a such a short period of time while developing, you know, it's crazy, no matter how you think of it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I um, I mean, I think basically just big props to our users generally, they're really um, very switched on very passionate bunch um, and very, very helpful, especially if we're delivering value to them. Um, they're really, really keen to help us because it helps them as well. Um, and we had a large number of existing users and people who got in contact just because of the product was coming. Uh, and we had a very, very successful research sessions with them um, to kind of run through our plans, designs, um, dem demo, uh, demo a few things um, and get some really What's also really nice is that they'll give very frank feedback. Doctors don't have a lot of time, so they, you know, they're not going to mince their words sometimes, which is great. They have enough time to you don't... scribble something in a very, very bad <laughs> yeah, handwriting. Ex well. Exactly. You don't, you don't want somebody who just looks at, the, uh, looks, at, looks at it, tries it out, and just says, yeah, that looks great. They actually will think about it and say, actually, this is going to waste me 10 seconds here. This is confusing. I, I imagine my colleague might fall over this bit. So, yeah, it's, it's been really, really helpful. For someone like me... Um who who's who's whose majority of role is to work with people um startups uh you know uh, employer uh branding and image etc etc i would say or i see something here and that's correct me by the way here if i'm wrong is it safe to assume you have or Acurex has built such a strong relationship with its users that the user feedback was that good when you really needed it it was that good yeah i mean short answer that is yes <laughs> yeah I, it's been it's 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 always amazed me um how passionate our users are and we've been able to uh, work so closely with them um and be able to respond to them quickly i think that's that's part of it. it's a give and take right <laughs> if if um if people are giving us accurate feedback and very useful feedback and we don't we don't act on that, we don't give them what they want, we don't deliver value, then that feedback very quickly tails off. So um, I think it's been, yeah, great, great relationship. I think, yeah, I think we're very lucky that we have users who really trust that when they tell us about things, we will like, take it on board and fix stuff. Uh, and I think it speaks a lot to just historically how much we really try to focus on what users need because they know that if they're telling us, you know, here's something that's really slowing our workload down, then we really will try to be resolving that and very quickly. So 
it, I think it means a great deal to them that they can come and say something to us that, you know, this really isn't working for me. And a week or two weeks later, that thing has been resolved. And so they know that they can do that. Uh, and like Mike's saying, it's a big give and take. We get that feedback and it's really useful for us because it means that we're building better things and it's useful for them. It's, it means that they've been very open about what they need and we're actually able to give it to them. And it's why we like to do a lot of user research, why we like to go into practices and shadow GPs and really see how they're working so that we can hone down on what we actually need to build. And it gives us that uh, really good steel of what we need to prioritise. That sounds to me that there's a lot of effort and manpower being put in to obtaining the right level of user feedback or into investing in the relationship with your users. Um, what, if you guys would give us, let's just say, an advice to other startups on how they could perhaps build this relationship, what is it that made it so different for you guys than others? Because I know a lot of tech startups potentially do what you guys are saying, but it's not even, they're not even close to having the relationship with your users that you guys have. Is there a secret or have you guys just been somehow lucky? <laughs> Yeah, I think we we maybe do try to follow a lot of what uh, other places would do, but really just bring that focus into everything. And I think that's also where a lot... Uh, and, and, you know, part of it is that we're very lucky that our users are so open with us and that they're really happy to engage with us. It, it doesn't matter how much user research hours you put in if people aren't engaging with it, right? Um, so we're very lucky that they are so engaged and so ready to, you know, sign up to be on the beta list for things uh, and very happy to get like the MVP of something, knowing that they'll get more features later, but be really happy to help us trial these things. But I also think we really try to bring that into every role. So, you know, whereas uh, engineers typically might not engage so much in research, for us, that's part of our day to day where we're going to research sessions and talking to users and really having that engagement because that also helps us build better things. It means all these micro interactions that we're putting into things are stuff that we've actually seen users doing. And those are the things that I think actually make the most difference to them. It matters a lot that they don't have to hunt for the right button every time that they want to do something. And, you know, you get a lot of that by having very good design and having user, very good user research. And we, we're very lucky to have very good designers and researchers and clinical leads and things at the company. But it also is helpful that we don't have to uh, take some things from user research and engineers here a subset of that and we only get a bit and we still build things that are, don't really work. It really helps that we're actually there. And we remember that, you know, I was in these two research sessions last week and I remember that people really weren't engaging that much with this bit. So I know that this is the steer for me. You don't have to have so much back and forth about these things. And it means that sort of everything is quite honed down to everyone working towards this one goal of, you know, here's us building the best thing for users. For this kind of project, working with a feedback, how, how, did you, how were you able to cope with that? Did you have to, you know, kind of get the whole company involved? Or, this is a huge number we're talking about, or I'm assuming it's a massive number because, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously, it was a pretty crazy ramp up in, in, in the first in the first four weeks from November, December, obviously the ramp up was a little bit slow because the the the, um, the volume of vaccines that were being delivered to practice is obviously quite low. They was they were still waiting for that to kind of kick up, but sort of come the new year, um, yeah, we very rapidly scaled out to sort of I, I don't even know the exact numbers, but certainly a, a very high percentage of GP practices in, in England were using us by the end of January, um, and what we found was. The, uh, just because of the, the time pressure the users were under and the complexity of the problem space itself, less so the product, but just they, you know, the, they were waiting for their vaccine deliveries. They were trying to work out which patients need to be invited when, chasing up patients, that kind of thing. It was all fairly time sensitive. And we found that basically we, we essentially had to, had to double our support team uh, to, to cope with just user queries. Uh, around vaccinations in general just to support them so I think we went from four to four to eight people mm. and they did an amazing job <laughs> like it was it was uh it was it must have been a baptism well I, I, I'd say must have it it was a baptism fire we were there supporting them as sort of second tier while they were 
getting getting um, running and um, that team just did an amazing job. I can't can't like say. So you realised straight away you just needed to add your to to to, to, to your people. You need to, to get more people yeah. on board to be able to handle that yeah, bit of workload. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we we hired um, for new um, people in the support team very very quickly. Just seeing that there was that demand for support and. Uh, obviously for us we were really keen to get people uh, like Mike was saying everything's very time sensitive um, and so to really be able to offer that support to say you know we'll get back to you uh, very quickly you're not going to be waiting days and emailing someone and not hearing back for us like we're very proud that our support is considered very good people know that they can support, get support very quickly and so as a matter of necessity we wanted to scale out the support team just so that we could offer that service to users to know that you know they can get support for anything, uh, e- even if it's something small, just not understanding like how to use a certain feature, um, and so it was almost necessary to get a lot more people in support. Uh, and then we, like Mike is saying, we worked very closely with them also to provide them support with, you know, onboarding and understanding new products, uh, and it was very valuable for us also to be able to see you know what's coming into support chats, what are a lot of people um, struggling with. Uh, you know, it's a big sign if a lot of people are saying, well, I don't understand how to use so-and-so interface, that you, we just need to change something there. Uh, and we would have a member of the support team with us every morning in our stand-ups, just because the pace of work was so high that we were delivering so many features at a time that it really helped for us to have somebody from the support team every day with us, just listening to, you know, what went out yesterday, what's going out today, um, to give us the feedback. So, you know, we've been getting a lot of feedback on this thing. Is this something that, you know, you can work on as a priority? And so we, um, we're very lucky to have such a good support team who, uh, you know, ramped up so quickly and were really able to so quickly get on with offering that support to all our users to give them that trust that, you know, we can use this new product. It'll be fine. We have the support if we need it. It's been what nine months since that specific phase, roughly January twenty twenty one. Now Time of flies. eight months, so yeah, exactly. It feels longer than yeah. that. It feels <laughs> a lot longer. But I'm sure to you guys, it feels much, much longer even <laughs> still. Um, but would you say um, the workload has declined, or are you still there? What I'm trying to say is, this is now on behalf of the Silicon Roundabout community. <laughs> people who probably hear this will get too excited. Are you looking for new people? Mm. Are you still looking to add people to your uh, to your you know to join you guys? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. No, we're we're still growing. Um, we really need um, we we need good people. Absolutely. Um, anyone uh, specifically within development, we're looking for for back end and full stack engineers. Um, but just generally people who really um, care about what they're doing, I think is really important because we have this kind of close relationship with our users. We want to keep that trust. We want to make sure we feel engaged. So I think anyone that really, um, really, really enjoys that side of things would do really well here. Yeah, I think our, our remit as product engineers at Accurex is is very wide in terms of really being able to engage with users, and being able to uh, do a lot more than kind of just thinking about software engineering. And so it's very interesting kind of role to be in this because you get to talk to so many different people and work with so many different members and different roles in the company and really get involved with everything and it's quite exciting almost to see the things that you build and really see people using them as opposed to making them and just having them go out into the ether and you never really see these things it's really nice going to user research sessions and also hearing about how you know something that you built a few weeks ago has had a massive impact on users just because you're engaging so heavily with going to user research sessions. We all do uh, support shifts uh, regularly. Um, every single person in the company will go on to our support chats just so, so that you still have that connection with the users. And it's really useful to be able to see, you know, how they're using things. What are they struggling with? What can you take back to your own work to say, actually, you know, I spent a few hours on support yesterday and I saw this thing coming up as a recurring thing. And to really take that back to your own team and your own work and say, you know, this is what we're doing so it's a very kind of interesting uh, role to be working in as an engineer here, just because there is so much almost to get involved in. I, th- I think also just um, what's really been really nice is because we've been a relatively small team um, and sort of developed a fairly efficient way of working. We've been specifically with the AccuBook work, we were shipping pretty much every day mm. for at one point. I didn't mean that we were all necessarily releasing code changes every single one of us every day that went that went live, but 
we were taking user feedback and shipping fixes on a daily basis. And it was really, really nice to see, you know, you would, you would see that reflected live in, you know, support would flag something up, something would go out and then they'd post back to us later that day or tomorrow to say, hey, this user just got back in touch to say their problem's fixed or they're able to do this more efficiently now and they're really happy. You're seeing it happen. Yeah, right it's, it's just, the, just the tight feedback loop there is just, it's great. It makes such a big difference. A lot of, a lot of uh, organizations, especially uh, tech startups, as it is our email, so I can run about, a lot of them um, sometimes keep their um, uh, scope open in terms of people's backgrounds, experiences. Are you guys, would you say the priority to you guys, the people's tech stack or their perhaps interest in user engagement? Which would you say is more important at this point to you guys? I, I personally think, I, th I think we're much more skewed towards um, interest in, in user engagement. With, I mean, I could list out our tech stack as it currently stands. We're not... Um, we're not specifically focused on what the tech stack is and more about people's people's ability to learn. Um, we don't have any particular novel, novel uh, tech stack. On the back end, uh, we're running um, C Sharp, .NET, uh, SQL. Um, we're on hosting on the Azure cloud platform. Um, so there's a few technologies there we're using uh, in terms of Azure cloud services. Um, but uh, And we're using uh, Kubernetes Docker for deployment of our um, services, but none of that I would say is important in terms of skill set. It's more about people's ability to care about what they're building um, and be able to learn on the job. If you were to look back, what would you say have been your proudest, I wouldn't say moment, but part of what was delivered? Yeah, so uh, a few months after we'd initially released AccuBook, we had a user come, um, he actually tweeted about how he'd booked his vaccine um, and he was completely blind. So he was basically tweeting about what a good experience it was. Um, and we got him in to talk in our weekly um, user call. So every Friday morning, we'll have a user come to talk to the entire company. And they can be anyone. So they're not just GPs, they're users in um, different roles, uh, you know, admin in different trusts and, and uh, patients who've interacted with things. And, and the whole company will get together to basically hear a little bit about how that person uh, is using our products or like wants us to develop our products differently and so he came in to talk about basically how he interacted with his technology being completely blind and how you know he had a very good experience with our booking system and how we could really continue that going forward so that was a very nice moment because it was just we uh, almost hear a lot more from GPs than patients who often even almost don't think about the fact that you know here's a separate software company um, and so we hear a lot less from patients and so it was really nice to hear from him just having that experience of being able to just book his vaccine and not feel worried by like oh I can't use this website and how will I do this and have to ring people up and really just have that experience because it was something that we really put a lot of effort into making sure the accessibility and stuff of our products really do work for people who not just people who are very sort of able-bodied and using things visually for people who have are very sort of differently abled and so it was very nice to see that it actually just was working for people and really was making a difference to them because to them it matters a lot right like if you're going in and you're desperate to get your vaccine it matters a lot that you can just do it of course so it was a it was a very nice moment i think just having him come and to the company <laughs> I, the, the, this whole thing actually this this whole the whole thing bringing bringing a user and hearing the feedback and the whole company i, I don't think i should have ever that's, that's, I don't think I've come across that throughout my whole time to look around about not a single tech startup has actually um, done, done, done that. So, yeah. Wow, hats off to you guys. Mike, is there anything else that stands out to you other than that moment? And then I appreciate this. It's yeah. probably very hard to talk, to be honest. <laughs> it is. Um, I mean, to, to add to what Alina said there, what's nice is that that's not even that's not even that unusual from our perspective. We have a regular, we do that weekly, or mostly weekly, most most weeks, every, mm, it's pretty yeah. much every week. Occasionally, people are, are unable to make it, but um, yeah, we we get a user in pretty much every week to to talk about which area of the product they're using. And what's really nice is they're also tell us what doesn't work so well as well. Nice candid feedback. Um, but I think from my perspective, uh, 
So obviously what uh, Luna touched on in terms of, of being able to provide value there, I think that's, that's been great. Um, what was really nice was when we started pulling the numbers in January to see how quickly people were booking in as well. I think that was really, really interesting for me. Um, and again, so January time, this was still with the old, the, uh, the oldest co cohort. So we were looking at sort of 80 plus and maybe down to 70 plus at that point. I can't quite remember the dates where they started scaling, scaling down through, through the years. Um, but when we were pulling the numbers uh, towards the end of January, we, we pulled it out. And what was immediately obvious was that the first 10% of people were booking in with two, within two minutes of being invited. So that is, um, our users would upload a list of patients through our system. We'd then queue up, send those text messages out. The patients are then clicking on that or opening that link, logging in with their date of birth or verifying and themselves date of birth, in. booking it in all within two minutes. And that's the, the first 10% of people who booked in were doing it within that time frame. And then we looked further and I think it was around 50% uh, of people were booking in in between one and two within one to two hours. Um, and we were getting a whole bunch of tweets from my, from my users saying, just set up this clinic with, you know, my 200 vaccines that are going to arrive next week, sent out our text messages, and it was booked within like four hours. And, you know, that was, if you can imagine the amount of time saved for staff, I mean, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely huge. So yeah, it was really nice to, to see that. Well, another, another, a bit of, a bit of, I suppose, uh, feedback from 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 user feedback so i i didn't actually get to um to use it but uh i can speak uh freely on behalf of my wife's parents uh my father and mother-in-law and um they obviously didn't have a call they thought oh yeah this is just they think this is the nhs etc um and they were absolute singing absolute praises and i know that perhaps um uh, you know to you know the, the that age group sometimes people aren't very technically savvy but you know based on the feedback i received from my from my father mother in law i would say thank you guys very much because it's it, you know they loved it it was very easy to use for them so yeah i could i definitely would support what your users are saying but i do want to drop in a couple of perhaps um curveball questions excellent first one <laughs> First one, this is this is uh, a fantastic bit of work, okay. And no short of um, a top, top, top tier um, bit of work. But should that scare potential employees away? You know the amount of workload that was put into this. Perhaps I can only imagine the hours that were put <laughs> yeah. in. Is that something to scare potential people off or? Is that something to get them excited about? I think it's a bit of both. I, I, it's definitely not something we plan to repeat. Um, and I'm really hoping the pandemic well, Hopefully there's no another pandemic. Yeah, hopefully there's no another global pandemic. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I feel like it was very much a, a one-off situation. Um, and we, obviously, we have a really passionate team. Um, and we were trying very hard to make sure that things were as sustainable as possible. But obviously, we were working more than we would normally do so. Um, so the main thing was just sort of keeping team health during that time. Um, and yeah, I think it was, it was certainly, it was, the thing is that we were all so passionate about it and excited that it, we had to sort of draw, you know, bring ourselves back in and make sure that we're not overdoing it because burnout obviously is a, a massive concern. And you've got to be productive. So I say, it would be counterproductive. In absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even in the course of four weeks, you're going to start feeling it by the end of that. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't know if Alina... Alina, you've, you've yeah. been here for what? You, I remember you mentioning at the start of this uh, conversation, was it, has it been a year or just over a year? Yeah, I joined I joined early summer last, early summer. last so year. Just um, over a year then? Just yeah, over, I, just I definitely, I think, it's like Mike's saying, this is uh, quite a one-off. I think a lot of our focus generally at the company is really of having that balance. Because like you're saying, it's counterproductive to really be pushing yourself all the time. You don't get anything out of that. It's And no one really wants to work like that. Um, and for us, you know, we considered that this is something that does need to go up very quickly and we were all very happy to work on it. Um, and, you know, we get a lot of energy by seeing the users and seeing how good it's been. But we definitely have quite a big focus on working sustainably in general. So, you know, all of our products aren't delivered in four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, the, uh, and I think um, that's that. Yeah, it's it's quite a one-off in terms of pace. Our pace is usually, uh, you know, it's fast. We're trying to be ambitious about how much we're delivering, but it's not uh, unsustainably fast. It, it's usually like a sustainable level of you know fast pace, but you know working reasonable hours and keeping that balance and and not um, just like having like overwork or anything. So for my second and final curveball, which I'm gonna. Uh, throw at you guys with that being said with everything being said are the challenges have you run out of challenges is it done is, is it, are you telling people now is the message that if you're joining us now it's just day to day duties no more big challenges so I, I think the short answer is um, that we've, we've got a whole bunch of other challenges coming up um, Accurate while it has been incredibly challenging um, and interesting, it hasn't, it technically speaking, isn't our biggest challenge. Um, the, wow, the biggest okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, for those who can't watch the video or just listening, my eyes are wide open right now. If that's not the biggest challenge, then wow, okay. <laughs> the, the biggest challenge with Acubook, obviously, was the timing and the vague requirements. Um, in terms of um, interesting technical problems to solve, we've got some big stuff uh, underway at the moment. So, yeah. Keep your keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> keep keeping people on their toes. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely you know the healthcare system in the UK is huge. The, it's I think one of the biggest employers in the UK, um, and there are so many people working in so many different roles, and there's so many different challenges. We're really focused on communication, but communication isn't just you know GP to patient. It's also GP to GP, um, people uh, doctors and uh, from like in doctors and GP practices to doctors in hospitals and different departments there's there's like uh, a lot of different issues to be kind of tackling there around really understanding you know how can we make things efficient in the whole system because all of these things benefit everyone and so we're we're very far I think from having finished every communication challenge uh, there, there is a lot out there and definitely I think that's part of why we're scaling up very fast because there's a lot of things for us to be tackling and things that are very interesting from a user perspective, things that are very interesting from a technical perspective. Um, it's very technically interesting to deliver things at that scale. And I think we're very lucky that, you know, most, uh, or, um, I think we're very lucky because most GP practices in the UK use at least one of our products. So, you know, we have a lot of users who are used to using our products, but it doesn't mean that they're We've solved every problem for them uh, in like everything that they do. There's still a lot of things where we kind of look at the problem and think we could we could do something about this. We could speed our workflows for people. We can make things easier, make patients have a better experience. So there's definitely a lot of problems still left. So Accurex is a lot more than just AccuBook. Um, stay tuned. There are more. There are more challenges on the way, and you're definitely not going to get bored. No, that's the message. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Elena, Mike, it's been great having you guys today. Thank you very much Thank for that. I know Thank a lot of people in the community will appreciate that. And um, yeah, I know lots and lots of people would definitely want to have a conversation with you guys later on just to know a bit more about working here. That'd be great. Look forward to hearing from them. <laughs> great. Thank you guys very much. Great. Thank Thanks. You. Bye.